Welcome to FACT's webinar called Managing Internal Parasites for Sheep and Goats, Attack the Enemy. This is the third and final part of our webinar series on this topic. Our presenter today is Linda Coffey. This webinar is hosted by Food Animal Concerns Trust. I am Larissa McKenna, FACT's Humane Farming Program Director, and I will be moderating today's session. Thank you for joining us. So I have just a few quick introductions as we begin. FACT is a national nonprofit organization that's headquartered in Illinois. We promote the safe and humane production of meat, milk, and eggs. I direct FACT's Humane Farming Program, which provides a number of opportunities for livestock and poultry farmers. This webinar is part of our Humane Farming webinar series. Please visit our website to learn more about all of our services, including the other webinars that we have coming up this winter. So this time I am pleased to introduce our presenter, Linda Coffey, Program Specialist with NCAT and ATRA. If you have uh, participated on one of our previous webinars in this series, you know that Linda is truly fantastic. She has a tremendous amount of experience and expertise on this topic. She comes from a family farm in central Missouri where they raised cattle, hog, sheep, and horses. Linda holds a master's degree in animal science and works primarily on sheep, goat, and multi-species grazing issues. We are incredibly lucky to have her with us again today to talk about the treatment strategies and protocols for defeating internal parasites and small ruminant animals. So without further ado, I am going to turn the floor over to Linda so that she may begin her presentation. Linda, please take it away. Thank you so much, Larissa, and thank you all for joining. I'm especially pleased that so many of you have been here for parts one and parts two. That shows dedication, and I really appreciate that. So I want to tell you before I start about the National Center for Appropriate Technology, which is the nonprofit that I work for, we advocate for small-scale, local, and sustainable solutions to reduce poverty, promote healthy communities, and protect natural resources. I work as an agriculture specialist in our Southeast office. You can reach me by emailing Linda C at ncat.org. You see this on the slide. And I really encourage you to check out our website because we have so much to offer with the ATRA Information Service. NCAT manages this service. I just encourage you to check us out for trustworthy, farmer friendly advice and publications and multimedia things, tutorials, webinars. Um, online courses. You can reach us by calling 800-346-9140 and we answer across the country uh, 8 to 5 Monday through Friday and we really want to help. We cover a whole range of topics, not just livestock, certainly not just livestock health and you could spend a lot of time on the ATRA website but I encourage you to use the search bar that you see up there at the top and call us so we can steer you to just what you need based on your situation. We really enjoy assisting farmers. Most of us are farmers ourselves, and I think we have a very practical approach to, to your concerns. And if you like Facebook, we'd like you to like us on Facebook. We have six regional offices, each of which has their own Facebook page. And what we do on these pages is promote local events, uh, things that we're involved in, places we're going, conferences. Um, my office in the southeast is in Fayetteville, Arkansas, northwest Arkansas. And we post little videos from our farms sometimes and put links to things that we are involved in. And so it's a good way to kind of get a sense of what's going on in your region by liking our, our local page. Headquarters is in Montana. West is in Davis, California. The Southwest in San Antonio, Texas. Northeast in New Hampshire. Southeast, as I said, is Fayetteville, Arkansas. And the Gulf States office is in Jackson, Mississippi. Also want to say again, um, we've got a podcast, which you can get from our website, or you can subscribe to it like from iTunes. It's called Voices from the Field, and it's really interesting, I think, because we cover the whole range of agriculture. We've got over 100 titles now. I listened to one last week that my office mate did about uh, soil, and it was really, really good. So I encourage you to check out the podcast. 
Those of you who have been here three times are bored with this, I'm sorry. I'm Linda Coffey and I work for NCAT on the ATRA project. And I also work on our family farm, which is called Maple Gorge Farm. It's a beautiful place near Prairie Grove, Arkansas. We have 50 acres, about half of which is grazable, and we raise Gulf Coast sheep and Alpine dairy goats. I've been involved with sheep. I was thinking about it this morning. I've been involved in sheep since I was about 10 years old with just about a nine month gap, that's all. I worked on the farm in college. Um, as soon as we got married and moved to Kansas, we got sheep. Um, I've had really uh, a long time experience with sheep and had dairy goats since 2001. That's the perspective that I bring to what I'm telling you, is that of a farmer and I, I'm trying to get you what you need to know and I, I hope I can do that. I couldn't bring you what you need to know without the help of the American Consortium for Small Ruminant Parasite Control. And I just have to make sure that you know about this organization. It's researchers, it's extension agents, the website is fantastic, it is searchable, and the people who run that really care about you and your animals and keeping your animals healthy. They do tedious work, in my opinion, fecal egg counts and counting worms, and it's uh, it's a lot. But um, wormx.info is the place to go to get the benefit from their work, which we all get. And I have to especially thank Dr. Joan Burke, who has written me into some of her work so that I could write publications for ATRA and participate in this webinar. So check out wormx.info. This week, I'm showing you something a little different. So this is the page of their website. You see those those bars at the top. I want to show you what topics are are listed under there. That helps you find the information that you want. And I also need to mention the training tab because you can find workshops to further your training. You can find instructors who can train you in FAMACHA. You can find materials. And if you can't find an in-person training, check out their online certification course. That's one more option for learning about FAMACHA. I think it's so important. It's a vital technique to know. I'm really pleased that a lot of you are using it. So this is part three. And we are going to talk today about treatment options, about how we can really attack internal parasites that have impacted our animals. But I hope that you will, if you haven't already, go back and watch part one and part two, because the preventive strategies from part two is really the core of what I want you to get. And I'll hammer that home a little bit today, too. We're going through all of this because we want our animals to be healthy. And we understand that internal parasites are the worst thing that most of our small ruminants are up against. So we need to know how to manage them. Parasites have developed resistance to our deworming medications. So they don't work so well anymore. That's why it's so important to do the prevention, as I mentioned. And even when they do work, and even when they did, deworming medications were always just a short-term fix. So we're not going to rely on those. And we're going to learn how to do this better. I used these quotes last time, but I love them. I really want you to, to get these points. I got to go to the American Dairy Goat Association Convention in 2003, and I heard some fantastic speakers. Dr. D.G. Pugh, dewormers are the worst way to manage internal parasites. And Dr. Sharon Patton, there are no chemotherapeutic solutions to overstocking pastures or poor husbandry. An ounce of prevention, she said, is worth a pound of panic here. That pretty well hits my philosophy, and I want you to know, before we start today, management trumps deworming. For example, there was some New Zealand work with merino lambs, where one group was drenched at weaning, drenched just means dewormed, and then rotated with cattle three times. And compared with the other group that was drenched at weaning and then set stocked, that means kept on the same pasture, and drenched every two weeks, which we'd never do that now. We know better. But the point is, one drench plus the rotating was more effective than 26 drenches. 
Think of the chemicals saved just by doing some, some smart management. Selection also trumps deworming. For example, Merino ewes, remember I said Merino ewes are not particularly known for parasite resistance, but we can make progress in every breed by selecting for this trait. Merino ewes that were selected for parasite resistance were compared with those that were not selected for parasite resistance, and the selected ewes had fecal egg counts reduced by 69%. And they had lower fecal egg counts even than the unselected ewes that were strategically drenched. Selection beats deworming. Another study showed some good news. If you select for resistance to barber pole, which we can do using the FAMACHA method, it's cheap and easy, those sheep were also able to resist other worms. So they're building an overall strength, not just an immunity to one type. However, sometimes we do have to resort to dewormers. So let's learn how to use them properly. And that is the point of today's session. Let's get a, a, a little foundation. Anthelmintix is the same as dewormers, is the same as drenches. And there are some, some definite benefits. The treated animal gets relief from the worm burden, which could save its life. And it causes a reduction in egg production, which means there's reduced contamination of the pasture. However, the anthelmintics are treating only the animal, not the pasture. And if you don't limit the larval intake, they get sick again very quickly. We gave an example of that last week. And in big bold letters, resistance problems because anthelmintics are not working as well as they once did. So today we're going to talk about that, the problem of resistant worms, how to keep dewormers working, how to know if they work, how to use them properly. I am going to talk just briefly about natural dewormers, but spoiler alert, you're not going to like what I say, I'm afraid. And we're going to go over some resources again, as we always do. And as we always do, let's start with the life cycle. Just briefly, parasite larvae are ingested by the grazing animal, and then they change and become adults, taking up residence in the digestive system and wreaking havoc. Then they um, reproduce and lay eggs, which are passed out in the manure. When the conditions are right, that is warm and moist, the eggs hatch and the larva move up the blades of grass and the animal ingests the larva. So that repeats the cycle. And remember, when you use an anthelmintic, you are treating the animal. So there's still gonna be the worm eggs and the larva out in the environment. So our goals as animal managers, as farmers, is to support our animal health by keeping stress low, by providing really good nutrition and sanitation. And as much as we can, we're going to graze to avoid the parasites. That was what part two was really all about. We're also going to select the animals that are well adapted and treat only those animals that need it. We will know how they need it by their symptoms. Remember that the internal parasites are damaging the digestive tract and the animals will have low energy. We'll see them lagging behind. We'll see them laying off by themselves in a pasture. They will not be excited about getting up and coming for feed. They won't be excited about grazing. So you see that low appetite and the decreased digestion means they're gonna grow very slowly, lose weight, and they're not gonna be able to produce as much milk as you're used to or wool or meat. In addition to those symptoms, which they all pretty well share, the barber pole worm is a blood sucker and it causes anemia which we diagnose using the FAMACHA technique, as I'm doing in the lower left picture. They may also have bottle jaws, we see in the upper right picture. The worms that are not barber pole generally do not cause anemia, but they may cause diarrhea, so scours. And to diagnose all of these, we use the five-point check. That's from South Africa. It is an awesome way to just think through looking at your animals. In South Africa, they check the nose for nose bots. Then they check the eyes using the FAMACHA technique, looking for anemia, which would indicate bottle jaw. They also check um, for bottle jaw, I'm sorry, <sighs> looking for anemia, which would indicate barber pole worm, 
bottle jaw goes along with that. Then they check the body condition score by feeling along the back and the ribs, just seeing how thin is the animal or how well fleshed and look under the tail for evidence of scours. As I would told you before, the five point check you can do partially just as you walk through your animals, but you gotta get in close to feel of the backbone. We don't really worry about nose bots here. So I look instead for energy and vitality and posture and a smooth, shiny hair coat. So these are indicators of health and this goat is showing good health. Well, we used to just treat them all. I remember being told when I was young, we should just clean them all out. Why do we not just do that? Well, because when we do, we are encouraging survival of the fittest in the worm population. We are encouraging the super worms to be more numerous, and we'll talk about how that is. There is a paper that you can find on wormx.info by Dr. Dahlia O'Brien. It's called Managing Dewormer Resistance, and she has an awesome um, bar graph in there. I wish I could have reproduced it here. Since I couldn't, let me just give you some of the information. So there was a recent study of Maryland, Virginia, and Georgia farms, and they found that more than 20% of the farms studied had resistance to all the drugs. That's not a good place to be. And nearly 100% of those tested had resistance to one class, the benzimidazoles, 80% had resistance to moxidectin. That's cydectin, that's a really good dewormer, but we have used them incorrectly. What we did, we treat everyone, and that increases the proportion of superworms in the next generations. I'll show you a slide about that. Or we underdose. We don't give enough of the medication, more of the tough worms survive. We treat them often, which gives them the opportunity to select for resistance. And we also treat and then move to a clean pasture. We used to recommend this. It makes good sense. You don't want your animal that is now empty of worms to get reinfected. But the problem is now all the worm eggs dropped are the ones with the resistant genetics. And then the proportion of tough worms increases in the next generation. I got this slide from the consortium and it graphically shows what I've been trying to say. So let's imagine one animal and inside of the animal are a population of worms. Some of them are susceptible. These are with the blue boxes. And some of them have resistant genetics. When we treat them with an anthelmintic, see the drug treatment in the center, it kills the susceptible ones, but not the resistant ones. And so in your next generation of worms that are coming out of the eggs that are coming out from that animal will be all resistant. Now multiply that by what if you treated every animal on your place? But we can do better. So the first term to learn today is refugia. Many of you have heard this already. Refugia means in refuge. What we want to do is protect the weakling worms so they stay in the gene pool, the opposite of survival of the fittest. So going back to our slide before, if you didn't treat, see, you would still have those resistant worms diluted with the susceptible ones. We're going to treat only those that need it, and we're not going to treat very often. What we're going to do instead is fix the management problems, refer back to part two, and call those animals that are not resilient or resistant enough. And when we do treat, we're going to treat effectively. All right, I was asked by name for the Dr. Kaplan 80-20 rule slides. So here they are. And thank you to Dr. Ray Kaplan. This shows the distribution of fecal egg counts in goat herds. Let me orient you. First on the top, that so you see the purple bars. On the top, do you see the scale there? 0, 4,000, 8,000, 12,000, 16,000, 20,000 fecal egg counts. That's a goat herd that has a really big problem. The graph on the bottom is a more normal situation where zero is the beginning and 4,000 is the upper, upper range. The point is both of these herds, although they have a, a difference in magnitude, have the same pattern. So where each of these purple bars are individual goats, if you drew a line 
segmenting off the top 33%, so and chose to only treat the top 33%, that would reduce the daily pasture contamination by 80%. Most of the eggs are in those animals. They're on the right-hand side. So treating just the upper third gives just as good a control as treating the entire herd. So we don't have to worry about we really should be treating them all. We just have to figure out who in our herd needs to be treated. Okay, now pay attention to the scale again because in the next slide he changes that scale to, to make a point. So here on the left, those little bars are the goats that did not get treated, the ones on the left. And now he's just changed the scale so that we can see them better, okay? So the individual goats now, the upper limit there is 400 eggs per gram on that herd. So we've treated the high 33% with a drug that was very effective, and we reduced the daily pasture contamination. And now that 33% of goats is only going to contribute less than 5% of eggs to the pasture. Remember, our dewormers are never 100% effective. There are still some survivors there. But since we did not treat any of those on the left-hand side, we've kept refugia on this farm and on both of these farms. And so more than 95% of the eggs that are being shed on the pasture now are shed by the untreated goats and they are still going to be susceptible to the anthelmintics. So the point is we have stopped the daily contamination, but we have kept refugia so that dewormers will still work in the future. It's complicated, but the point, I, I find the point very reassuring because the idea that if we only treat the ones that need it, we are improving the situation on our farm now and in the future. Remember that refugia refers to the refuge inside the animals by not treating all of them and outside on the pastures by we're not going to treat and then move to a clean pasture. We're going to keep that dilution and that refugia happening. So I hope you're convinced we're going to treat only those that need it. And so our first step is to find out who needs to be dewormed. We can do that by using the five point check by using fecal egg counts. And we should pay some special attention to those classes of animals that have really high nutrient demands, the periparturian ewes and the does that have twins or triplets. There's a lot happening there while they're trying to make that much milk. And the yearlings, I always kid and, and lamb at one year of age, those animals are still growing and making milk and have just produced a baby. So they, need, they might need attention too. For the lambs and kids at weaning time, often some of them will need it. Let's especially look at the ones that are twins or triplets because they didn't get as much nutrition while they were nursing. So let's pay attention to them. And then say deworm them all though. One that we are going to deworm, even if she looks good, like this goat does, is new purchases. We don't know what kind of worms a new purchase is bringing onto the farm but we don't want her spreading resistant genetics out onto our pastures. So we're gonna deworm her effectively with combination, like, uh, and I'll talk more about that later, because we wanna make sure she's not uh, bringing, that's one way that we bring worms onto our farm is in new animals, okay? So we will check her seven to 10 days after we've dewormed her to be sure she really is safe to put out on our pasture. We're gonna look at our animals that have poor condition. We've already said this using the five point check, but listen, if most of our animals don't look good, then we have to address nutrition, not just deworm them. So let's remember to use management as our first step. I'm really pleased that most of you said that sometimes you use a veterinarian because we need one. Why? Because so few drugs are approved for sheep and goats and they're not effective in the labeled doses often. So extra label use is necessary. This is regulated by the Food and Drug Administration and it requires a valid veterinarian client patient relationship. Now, I get it. 
Some of you have said, and I, I hear this and I know what exactly what you mean, the veterinarian doesn't know about sheep or goats. If they are somebody who is willing, you can help them learn. And I wrote a tip sheet about that, which we will have you sent by email afterwards. It's called Working With Your Veterinarian. Um, they can be a good partner for you. So now we're about to get into talking about deworming. One thing I want you to know is there is a way that you can, for a lot of medications, improve the dose. And you can do that by fasting those who need to be dewormed for 12 to 24 hours. It adds a step. It adds some hassle. But if you can get them in and hold them off feed, not off water, that will slow down the digestive system so the drug has more contact time with the worms and that greatly increases the e efficacy. For example, in New Zealand, there was a study where they drenched empty animals. It increased the effectiveness of the kill of resistant barber pole from 53% to 97% using ivermectin. That's really exciting because uh, it gives us one more way to help our dewormers be effective. But I would not do this if your animal is already in crisis. If they have bottle jaw or Famacha score five, which is very anemic, those are emergencies and we go ahead and treat them. Don't worry about, in fact, they probably haven't been eating for a little while anyway, if they're in that situation. Now we have to use a proper dose and treat according to the weight of the heaviest in the group. I sort them first, put the ewes in one group and the lambs in another so that you're not continually in your head switching around. Or maybe you could have a different dewormer gun for lambs and, and for ewes. But make sure that you weigh your animals. I have a story for you. We had a big Suffolk ewe and, and I figured she probably weighed 175 pounds. And when we dewormed her, we dosed her for 175 pounds. And then we sold her and found she actually weighed 250. So we were underdosing her every single time. You can't always trust your eyes. And so weighing animals is the best. My husband built a scale which is digital and it wasn't very expensive and it works really nicely. So now if we're going to deworm our animals, we've got information. A weight tape works for dairy goats, but not for meat goats. So you can certainly um, use a weight tape if dairy goats are what you have. And speaking of goats, they don't get the same dose as sheep. In most cases, they get double the dose, but we'll talk about that um, with some restrictions. So you can see the charts at wormx.info in the topic of dewormers. They have one chart for sheep, one for goats, and one for camelids. You gotta have the proper tools. So what we're saying here is deworming guns that have an angled piece. You see how the slant goes? So any of these styles are fine. That slanted piece is important and make sure it's calibrated correctly to dose for the heaviest animal in your group. Sometimes, um, sometimes we don't get that step done. The reason we need these tools is so we can do the right technique. We want that dewormer delivered all the way into the back of the mouth so it doesn't bypass the rumen. That's also for getting more contact time with the drug, which will make it more effective. And if you've ever dewormed one and you're in a hurry, you went you know, really fast and it splashed, then you know why I'm saying you should go slow and steady and be sure that they swallow that dose. Proper tool, proper technique, proper drug. Let's go over some fundamentals. First of all, consult your veterinarian. And remember that the drench right assay or a fecal egg count reduction test is how you will know if they work or not. If you are using extra label, you need that valid veterinary patient client relationship. Check the expiration date. Once we started doing FOMACHA, we used so much less deworming solution that it would get expired on us before we ever needed to use a whole jug. It's not going to work well if it's expired. So check that. Keep the drug stored properly. Follow the label directions. Um, my friend Dave Scott in Montana says that if you accidentally freeze the drugs, they don't work. So there's a warning for y'all that live up north. Be sure your dosages are correct. Again, 
know what the animal weighs, use those charts so you don't make a math mistake. If you're diluting, if you're making a solution, follow the directions. And always use oral formulations, not injectable, not pour on. Research has shown that the oral ones work the best. Today we have so many words, every now and then we threw in a pretty picture. And now we'll talk about the drugs themselves. So we have in our country three different classes of anthelmintics. The benzimidazoles, which includes Panacure, Safeguard, Valbazin. Uh, the second class, which includes Levamisole and uh, Morintel. And then the Aver uh, Avermectins in class three. They're grouped this way because of their mode of action. So if you get resistance on your farm, the parasites get resistance to a certain drug within a class, they are probably also resistant to the other ones in that class. So if you got resistance to Panicure, Valbazin would not be a good bet. So let's go into them uh, one at a time. The benzimidazoles. Uh, are the white dewormers, and you don't use albendazole in the first 30 days of pregnancy. Fasting before treatment really helps the efficacy of this class, but remember in that study in, in the south, uh, every farm studied had some resistance to this class. So it's exciting that there is an, another way to use these drugs still that can help efficacy, uh, Dr. Joan Burke did work where she used two grams of copper oxide wire particles in combination with uh, albendazole and found that it bumped efficacy up to 99%. So that's really exciting because there is widespread resistance. So copper oxide wire particles used in combination can really help these be effective. The second class has a warning too. Uh, Levamisole can cause toxicity. Don't fast your animals before using that drug. We don't want more contact time with that. And be very careful about dosing. Weigh your animals first, dose accordingly. And whereas I said goats take usually a double the sheep dose, not for Levamisole. Goats get one and a half times the sheep dose, not double the dose. So you can get into some toxic uh, reactions. Ivermectin and moxidectin both work against the hypobiotic larva. Remember we talked about that, that that's how uh, barber pole worm gets through the winter in, in a lot of areas, is to go into kind of hibernation inside our animals. So it's really good to have drugs that can clean out those larvae before um, the periparturiate rise. And of course they work against the matured. The question is, do they work on your farm? We overused these medications for so many years in the case of ivermectin, it worked great for 25 years in a lot of farms and then it didn't. So I encourage you to see whether they still work on your farm. Oh, and I should say this, this one, ivermectin, if your animals have resistance to ivermectin, moxidectin might still work for a time because it's more potent, but it's just a matter of time once you have some resistance. All right, so back to these are our three classes. And as I said, once you have resistance within a class, you have resistance to the other drugs within the class. So should you rotate them? Not unless you have to. The recommendation is use one class of drug until it stops working. Again, we use fecal egg count reduction test or a drench right assay to figure which drugs are working. Use another class until it stops working, and then the third class. And your fourth option are combinations. So if you are using Valbazin and it stopped working, you could, you could choose to use Valbazin plus Levamisole and get an effective deworming. Do you see how that is? You would not choose to use Valbazin plus Safeguard. Same mode of action, don't do that. And just a word about the fecal egg count reduction test, which I mentioned often, this is the reason why that time frame is important. So larva 
to egg laying from the time that the animal ingests the larva until that larva can be mature and laying eggs inside the animal only takes two to three weeks in the summer. So when we're deworming and we want to know, did the dewormer work? We have to give it some days to clean out the worms, okay? So we give it seven days, but then we want to get our fecal sample tested before the 14 days because the new infection could uh, complicate our results. So in other words, we want to check seven to 10 days after the treatment to see if our drug was effective. And this is the formula. We want at least a 95% reduction or we suspect resistance. I say we suspect resistance, but let's admit there could be another reason for anthelmintic failure. It could be poor technique. It could be the wrong dose. We, we guessed the weight wrong or we just did our calculations wrong. Our equipment maybe didn't work. An animal maybe spit the dose out or the drug was expired or had been improperly stored. There's, there could be some other reasons. But if you paid attention to the fundamentals and the dewormer failed, then resistant worms would be the factor. And it's very common. So combinations. This is what we do when the drugs aren't working well anymore. And it doubles the cost but you get the efficacy from combining two different classes of drugs. You use the correct dose of both. You do not mix within a syringe. So don't take a bottle of one and pour it in the bottle of the other because the chemicals aren't, um, aren't conducive to that. Give, give one syringe for each drug. Give the correct dose of both. And don't forget about refugia because if you if you don't take care of refugia now, you're going to risk getting worms that are resistant to both of these classes of drugs. So it's very important, only treat the ones that need it, but treat them effectively. To calculate the withdrawal time, you use the longest time of the drugs used. You don't add them. So if the withdrawal for meat for the drug you used was 14 days for one and 10 for the other, use 14 days for your withdrawal time for meat. Copper oxide wire particles are an option here too. Remember that we, we said that it made it so much better used with albendazole. They've also tried it with levamisole. So copper oxide wire particles might be uh, a way that you get a better combination treatment. You got a large herd and you don't like messing with wet sheep Feeding dewormers can sound very appealing. Let's just put it out in the trough and let them eat it. It's quick, it's easy, it's less stress. But how could you make sure they get the right dose? And the answer is you can't. The big bossy animals are going to get more and any animal that is feeling poorly isn't going to eat enough. I found this with Golden Blend too. I, I really like the idea. There's no milk withdrawal for my dairy does. It's a, it's a great idea, but when they actually needed it, they would not eat it. If you can't make them get the right dose, you can't help the animal and it leads to resistance. So don't feed dewormers, even though it's easier. Someone's asking about well, the copper oxide wire particles. And I guess I didn't talk about that last week and I really probably should have. Copper oxide wire particles and Cerisa lespidiza are two options, non-chemical options that are effective. Research has shown that they work. I have outro publications about both of those that go into great details. There is also uh, information on wormx.info, talks about the copper oxide wire particles and how they work and why they work and how to repackage them. Because as far as I know right now, you still have to break down um, a, a bolus from a 12 and a half gram bolus down into a one gram or a two grams. And all the instructions, again, are in those publications. Those work, they have been proven, there's research to back it. What about DE? No. <laughs> and what about pumpkin and garlic and herbal dewormers and wormwood and oregano oil? We all wish that these really did work, but they have not been shown to be effective under the conditions of the research studies. 
And it's disappointing. I want to tell you something, though. There are people who think that they do work. And and I've got some theories about that. One is there could be some nutritional thing that's missing on a particular farm so that these actually do help the immune system in some way. And sometimes something that we're doing is working and we aren't giving the right credit to the right thing. I'll give you an example. I went to see my friend who has a beautiful meat goat herd and she said, it's because of this mineral mix I'm using. It is fantastic. So I went over to check it out. She's mixing her mineral mix. It has kelp in it. It has garlic in it. She's putting in all kinds of expensive ingredients and mixing it by hand. And her animals look great. And then they stand up and they stretch and they casually walk over to the edge of the pasture and under the barbed wire fence and off the farm and into the woods. I said, they do that all the time, don't they? I mean, I could see the trail. She said, yeah, every day they can run a thousand acres. They can get anywhere on this mountain they want to. My neighbors don't care. So do you think that maybe leaving the manure and roaming in the woods freely and getting acorns and persimmons and plenty of brows. Do you think that might be what the real benefact beneficial thing was? I do. Not to say that the mineral mix didn't help, but uh, let's pay attention to our fundamentals of management and let's don't put our faith in these things that have not been proven to work. There's a new option available for us. It's a worm trapping fungi. The trade name is Bioworma. And there is an article on wormx.info about it. It is new in this country. And uh, I mean, like this week landed in Kansas and they're going to be offering it through Premier. What it does, it works to lower the pasture contamination. It's fungi, it's fungal spores that you feed, you mix it in feed or in a loose mineral mix and they have to ingest it. Every animal has to eat it every day for at least 60 days. And it goes through the digestive system and is in, in deposited in the manure right along with the worm eggs. And when the worm eggs hatch, there's the fungus and it stops the larva from getting out. There's some super cool pictures on wormx.info about the loops and the stickiness. It's pretty, it's pretty incredible, really. Um, it is available in the US. It is environmentally safe. It's a way to address pasture contamination. Questions that I have are, what does it cost? And, it, and again, let's don't be complacent. Really, we need to move away from that manure. We need to do good pasture management. Um, that just has to be the foundation. But worm trapping fungi around the periparturiate rise, I can see some, some definite uh, beneficial aspects to that. So copper oxide wire particles is something that, uh, oh, Cynthia wants to know where we can buy bioworma in the US. As my understanding that Premier is going to offer it, but they don't have it yet. It's just too too new. So copper oxide wire particles. Uh, again, I wrote an Atro publication, and there's best management practices series on WormX.info for a lot more about it than I can go into today. Something to know is it works against the barber pole worm. So we use Famacha to decide who to dose. This is not something that you want to give to every animal. Some certifiers are allowing the use of this in organic lambs and kids. That's very exciting for those raising organic animals. It's effective as part of a combination treatment. It gives a quick response, but not a long lasting response. And the concerns with sheep are, would it build up in the liver, you know, and cause toxicity? Uh, I know Dr. Burke has used four doses in the grazing season, and that did not build up in her conditions to a toxic condition. So that's good to know. But it, caution is suggested that you, you check livers when you can to see, to make sure that it's not building up too much. Something else I wanted to say about this. I lost it. Oh, something else I wanted to say about Ceresia. I will later. 
sorry. Keep records. This is something that we really need to focus on doing because that's the only way we can really make progress in our selection process and because it's important to have the health records. We should know which animals we dewormed on what day, with what drug, at which dose, and what our criteria were. Were you looking at FAMACHA, our body condition score, or poopy butts? What was your criteria? And you should have individual flock uh, individual FAMACHA scores and also look at the flock scores to track trends. I'll show you that in the next slide. To test efficacy, at least every couple years, you need to be running the fecal egg count reduction test or the drench right assay and keep your records of that. And keep pa pasture management records. Go back to part two. If you want to be sure you're not going back too soon to an infective pasture, you need records showing when did you leave. So this is Dr. Ray Kaplan's FAMACHA anemia record. You are going to keep individual records, so you will have an animal ID associated with their FAMACHA score. That way you know who's doing what. But you also want to be able to see the trends of your whole flock. So to orient you on this record, across the top where it says category, one, two, three, four, five. Those are the FAMACHA scores where one is healthy and five is anemic, like white. And generally speaking, we're going to treat the fours and fives and sometimes the threes. We'll go into that. So in this farm on May the 1st, they started doing their FAMACHA record. Remember, we're going to do that during the grazing season in the summer because this is a warm weather kind of parasite. And we're looking at barber pole worm. Each time they did a FAMACHA, they not only wrote down the individual ID on a separate sheet, but they put a dot in the appropriate category so that at the end of the day, they could tabulate these and say, oh, we had 15 ones, 27 twos, 12 threes, and we had that one animal that was a four and it needed to be dewormed, and we did. Two weeks later, they check again, and you can see that the flock has changed and become more anemic. This time, only five ones, 22 twos, 23s, and eight fours, which were treated. Two weeks later, June the 1st, do you see how the flock has shifted? And now we have 11 fours and one five. So at this point, you've got a decision to make. One one decision that you could reasonably make is say, I see that the flock is shifting to more anemic. I'm going to do something different in my management. I'm going to check next week. I'm not going to wait two weeks to check my flock. Or you might say, I'm going to check next week and if I'm going to check next week and if the trend is still like this, I'm treating threes and fours and fives. So this is a helpful tool in, in just seeing where your whole flock is at. This is a close-up look at it. Is this available online? It comes with your FAMACHA card, I believe, but you can look online under the information about FAMACHA to see if that is posted on wormx.info. Thanks for that question. It's really important that you keep your records and that you monitor constantly. I, I think it's important to get in the habit of looking at your animals every day. We can pick up on subtle things when we're looking at them every day. The way they move, how much energy do they have? Do they um, seem to be grazing well or do they come up to the feed trough you know, excited? What do the coat or fleece look like? Do you see scours? If we pick up on these things quickly, we can take action before we get in a serious problem. And I like to look at the lambs and kids and see how lively they are. Because sometimes when our mamas get worms, the first thing that we see is not them losing weight, especially a, a wooled sheep. You won't notice that, but you might notice their animals, their lambs and kids not looking as good because they're not getting as much milk because the parasites are shutting down milk production and then their lambs and kids don't, don't thrive. So let's watch those. And let's keep feeling of those backbones when we can. Let's, let's guard from them getting too thin too fast. Understanding they're going to lose weight when they're milking, but we don't want them to get emaciated. 
We can monitor with fecal egg counts. That's especially good for checking pasture contamination. And again, we can do FAMACHA every two weeks for lambs and kids, or more often, if it seems like the flock is having more trouble, we should do it more often. I'm gonna pay special attention around periparturient time because remember the immune system relaxes a bit and, and that's when the hypobiotic larvae sometimes spring into action. And when there's been a drought and then a good rain, you wanna check those two weeks later. And here's why. During the drought, your animals were shedding eggs in the manure but the pellet was drying out on the outside and so the larva could not escape. So they're like stockpiling on your pasture. Then a rain comes, it softens those manure pellets, the larva does escape and enforce out on your pasture. And when there's been a drought, maybe your grass hasn't grown very well, maybe you're grazing a little too short now to try to just keep your animals fed. And so they're vulnerable, They've not been well nourished, they're going to graze too short, and all of those larvae out there. So we need to look at our animals a couple weeks later. Does it make sense? This is Dave Scott's flock in Montana. Are you all ready for spring? So coccidia. I showed you those three classes of drugs earlier, the benzidomaz benzidomazoles and all of that. But coccidia do not respond to those same drugs. Coccidia damage the intestines of our animals, sometimes permanently, if they're not treated. If they, if they get through the young age, they usually have immunity, but they're still going to be shedding coccidia in their feces, which is how the young ones get exposed and get sick when they're under stress. Scours is the first symptom we see, and I wrote a paper called Coccidiosis, Symptoms, Preventions, and Treatment in Sheep, Goats, and Calves. That goes into a lot more detail than I'm going to today, and it goes into the drugs and the prevention. Uh, first prevention thing, though, is sanitation. Keep it clean, keep it dry, and good nutrition. Keep them well-nourished. The medications are listed in the Atropub, and if you're not going to follow directions, don't bother with the medications because they will not work. So read the, the labels carefully. Follow the directions if you're going to use those. If you're an organic producer, you can't use those, but you can use Cerisa lespedeza. Here's the thing about Cerisa lespedeza. It's a warm season legume, and so it is not growing in my pasture when I have periparturient animals or young kids and lambs. You can put up hay, though, and then you could offer that in the lambing pens. You could give that in a creep area maybe to your young animals. If they nibble on it, that can help protect them. And so coccidia... Coccidia and the barber pole worm are both impacted by Cerisa lespedeza and other high tannin forages. And yes, um, the question from Leslie, isn't it considered a noxious weed in some parts of the country? Yes. So in some parts of the country, you can't plant it. It's growing wild on my farm, and so I use it, but I know in Missouri they really frown on it. I think Kansas, Colorado... Um, considered a noxious weed. So it can't be used everywhere, but if it grows and it's legal where you are, or if it's on your farm already, you can consider this as something you can use. Last week, somebody asked about liver flukes, and I admitted, I don't know anything about liver flukes. I've never had any experience with it, but I looked it up and I found that these do need an intermediate host, which is snails. So it is not that simple life cycle like I've been showing you week after week. These are really nasty organisms. The flukes are ingested from the vegetation. A cyst is left on the vegetation. The animal eats it and they hatch and they penetrate the intestines on their way to eat the liver. So they're nasty creatures, and they cause, of course, internal bleeding while they're doing all this damage. So the symptoms that you might see sound a lot like barber pole worm to me, anemia and bottle jaw. Those of you who have experience with liver flukes, if there's something I'm missing, um, let me know. But I, it seems to me it would be a little bit confusing about which worm you were dealing with. 
Prevention is better than cure, and you need to fence them out of the marshy areas and the ponds, so keep them away from where the snails are living. And the one drug I found that is labeled for this is Valbizin, but it kills adult flukes and not other stages, so it won't work against those immature stages. I didn't know about liver flukes because I don't have any experience with them. But if liver flukes are active in your area, your veterinarian will know. Consult your veterinarian to find out about worms that are important where you live and to find somebody who can help you with fecal egg count reduction tests, things like that. Uh, unless, of course, you're going to get your own microscope and do it yourself, which is an option. You can go to the Langston website and learn about that. Um, I think that... If it were me and I had an animal die and I wasn't sure, necropsy could be really, really helpful. For example, if you didn't know if it was liver flukes or barber pole worm, that'd be important to find out. So use the services of your veterinarian. I'm not a veterinarian, but I am the mother of one. I can tell you they work really hard and long and spend a lot of money to get their education. So I hate to see people in chat rooms asking medical questions that I know a veterinarian could answer with authority and with great information. I really encourage you to try to find a good veterinarian who will work with you. If they don't know about sheep and goats yet, if you're willing to help teach them, that helps the next generation of farmers coming up behind us. So I encourage you to do that. There is so much to learn, which is why we've taken three weeks to go through this. But we have a lot of information available to help us manage our animals successfully. Wormex.info, Atra, um, we just have to be smart and we have to use a lot of strategies. There is no silver bullet here. We have to use all the prevention strategies that we possibly can. We don't want to put our faith in any treatments. None of them are working perfectly. None of them are going to work perfectly. So doing your prevention piece, doing good management, providing good nutrition, selecting for parasite resistance in your animals not in your worms, um, and careful and sparing use of anthelmintics. These are the keys. This again is my short list of resources, ATRA and the consortium and Langston University and the American sheep industry and SARE. And, and remember I said you can look up research on um, the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education, searchable, check out what they have about internal parasites. Farmers have done some on-farm research that you might be interested in, and scientists have done some research that I know you'll be interested in reading about, so check it out. Here's a few things that I think might be helpful to you. I can't actually call it homework since I won't be back next week, I guess. But if you go to wormx.info and explore the topic of dewormers, that will give you more information than I could provide today. If you missed part one or part two, I'd really like you to watch them at some time so you get the whole picture of what I was trying to um, tell you. The next time you need to deworm, think about getting a fecal egg count reduction test to see if your drug is still effective. And then if you don't have a system for keeping records of health treatments. It's time to set one up. Plan that you're going to notice which animals need frequent deworming and call them to make your flock stronger over time. And if you're not FAMACHA trained yet, that might be a really good goal to put on your list for this year. Remember, you can use the online certification from the wormex.info or in-person trainings are really, really best. So good luck. I have really enjoyed being with you these three weeks. Um, you've asked some fantastic questions. Remember, you can still ask me questions after this because it's my job to answer them. And my email is lindac at ncat, that's N as in national, C as in center, appropriate technology. Or you can call us at 800-346-9140. I am about to go on um, vacation in March, so uh, email will work better for me because I will check my email some. And I'm going to close with this quote from Meat and Wool New Zealand. They say, put drench in the bottom of your toolbox. And I agree with that, but let's keep it in your toolbox. Let's use our smart strategies so that it will still work for you for years and years. 
I want to also tell you, check out the upcoming ATRA webinar. Uh, I've, I've referred throughout this series to my friend, um, Dave Scott. He's got one coming up in March 14th. Don't let the barber pole worm ravage your flock. And he's an excellent teacher and has a lot of great experience to share. So I encourage you to register for that. And we're going to send out links to the slides and to other resources. Larissa is so awesome. She does that every week after you get off of this. So she'll tell you how to get to parts one and part two also. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Linda. This was a wonderful, um, a really fantastic presentation. So we do have a couple minutes for questions and it looks like um, you've answered a bunch of them already just um, by going through your presentation. It seemed like the questions that came in, um, the next slide would, would kind of answer that. But um, I will be sending out, we will take any other questions people have in the next couple minutes. Um, and like Linda said, I will be sending out links to parts one, two, and three, both the recordings and the slides. Um, and I'll also include um, a link to that um, Barbara Paul uh, uh, webinar coming up in March um, and a host of other resources that, that Linda has provided. Um, so with that, let me look through here. Um, we did have a question, Linda, that came in. <laughs> Someone wanted to know if they could get plans to the cheap digital scale that your husband built. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he got a kit. He got a kit online and then he, I think he, he just figured it out. He likes to build things and he figured it out so that one person could run the thing with a front door and a back door and strings to pull and goodness. What I think I could do is send a picture to somebody, you know, sure. <laughs> of what it is and some dimensions, but uh, I think he invented this on his own. <laughs> oh, I see the question up here about is dirty butt the same as scours? Yes, I should not <laughs> use such an informal term. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we all know each other well. It's part three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, we've had a couple, I uh, wouldn't say these are questions, but um, people wrote in saying that the copper oxide wire, they looks like they're available um, in boluses of two grams and four grams. Um, oh, yeah. And I guess that would be for goats, but then they, there's the option to break it down for the sheep. Um, it looks like Jeffers has them. And someone also said you could get them online at, where was it? Copasture. Yeah, Copasture, yes. Okay. And I, I, I'm i glad to hear that. That saves a lot of hassle. The two gram dose is good for um, the goats. And I think it'd be okay for use. They use a smaller doses than that for young animals, like half a gram or one gram, depending if it's a sheep, it gets half a gram and a goat gets one gram. But mm -hmm. that would be a pretty easy process to take a two gram and divide it. And directions for that are available in those publications that I mentioned. Excellent. Um, yeah. Someone did ask if um, you can give too much copper oxide, if can they become resistant to that? Or I we have not seen, that's a great question. We have not seen resistance to that. And, and that was one of the exciting things about that combination. I don't think I mentioned the population that she was testing these in. They had a mix. They had barber pole worm, but also some that were not barber pole worm. And they were resistant to albendazole. And yet when she combined albendazole with the two grams of copper oxide, 99% efficacy. So that's really exciting. So, but yes, you can, you can give too much copper, they think, and cause toxicity, but we have not seen resistance to it yet. I will add this. She has seen sometimes when the copper oxide did not work as well, and the observation was, it was when the animals were under stress at mm -hmm. weaning time. You would not give them the copper oxide the same day you weaned. That's too much stress, and they're not, not likely to work effectively. Does that make sense? Uh, it does. It does. Absolutely. Um, Another question came from about um, the uh, effectiveness of ginger. Do you know anything about that? It would, or would be on the, the list. I of don't. That, I don't. Yeah. There is a section on wormx.info where they go into alternatives, any that have been studied, and you can find information there. Uh, I would encourage you to read that. Excellent. Um, question about the uh, Cerisa pellets. Those, those yeah. have been available from Sims Brothers, Sims, S-I-M-S, 
brothers and I don't know what they cost. I don't know how you get them, but you could go to the Sims Brothers website and find more information about that. They seem like a very convenient thing to have. If they're not too expensive, they, they would be a really nice thing to have on hand. Mm -hmm. It looks like there's a lot of requests for a picture of your scale, so ah. maybe we can follow up with folks. It might not come out with the with the first follow up email because that's 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 sooner rather than later. But um, right. we'll try to get we'll try to get something to you guys. Well, it, it, I was really proud that he that he made that because it's made such a difference for us, and just yeah. that ability to know what your animals weigh. It also helps you notice if you might have a problem just from low growth. You know, yeah. if you're not managing your pastures well enough to get good growth or maybe somebody is uh, needing to be dewormed and you can watch those trends from weighing your animals. So it's been really good. And I'll take one more question at this point um, before we wrap up. But it says, a uh, question is, do you recommend deworming all does after kidding as a prevention or just to monitor with a five point check and fecals? I don't deworm all does at kidding time. Uh, but I'm not sure that's really a recommendation thing. I, I don't deworm my animals at kidding and lambing. I watch them though, because they're about to go into a very stressful time. Remember, I'm kidding and lambing in, in January and February too. So th that I think the answer should change based on when you are kidding and lambing. Um, we have to consider refugia and we have to consider animal health, but I know that, so mine, mine have been nursing lambs for, in some cases, six weeks and they are still doing fine, but I'm paying attention to nutrition and I'm watching their behavior every day. Does that make sense? It would be convenient to do them in the lambing pen before you turn them out, but I don't, that's not what I do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, thank you for that, Linda. Um, I do have a couple of housekeeping keeping items to share before we sign off um, with from you all today. Immediately following this, we will be asked, like I mentioned earlier, to complete a very, very brief survey. And I know that um, both Linda and I would greatly appreciate it if you take a minute to tell us about your experience so that we can make things even better for the future and um, be able to support you and whatever ways you need. Um, like I mentioned, a recording of this webinar and the presentation slides will be available very soon. They're going to be archived on our website, and you can also look for an email from me um, with them and lots of other links. And like I said, I'll uh, include links to the recordings of the other webinars in the series as well. And um, we have quite a few more webinars coming up in the spring and um, winter and spring. Next week, we are featuring Annie Warmke from Blue Rock Station Farm in Ohio. Uh, she'll be leading a goal setting session to help participants identify ways that they can earn a living doing what they love to do, in this case, farming. Um, so we'd be delighted if you would join us for uh, what should be quite an inspiration, uh, inspiring webinar. Um, and on that note, Linda, do you have any parting thoughts on this final webinar before we? Well, I, I just really wanna thank you all. I think you've been a really good, audience and I appreciate your staying engaged through these long, long presentations. <laughs> Sorry about that. But uh, thank you very much. Do let us know if there's anything else you need. And she, when she says it's a brief survey, she is telling you the truth. It will really take you, I bet, a minute, maybe less. <laughs> so yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Larissa. It's been an honor to be in your slate of presenters. It's been an honor for me, a real pleasure too, uh, Linda. It's been, these presentations have been fantastic and I hope that you'll consider coming back to presenting with us in the future. Um, Absolutely, thank you. <laughs> and thanks to our audience members for your attention and interest. I hope that you'll join us on a future webinar as well. I hope that you all have a wonderful afternoon and that you stay warm, warm and safe out there. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> Goodbye, thank you. Mm -hmm.